Hello everyone, my name is Nachiketa and welcome back to another video. In this video, I'm going to guide you through a complete time series forecasting project done using recurrent neural networks, more specifically LSTMs. Now, I'm going to guide you through the project through the entire notebook and I'm going to show you how to analyze the data, how to pre-process it. And the most difficult part is basically how to format the data correctly to feed it to your neural network model. Importing the model and training it is actually the easiest part which is done in just a few lines of code. Now we're going to be using recurrent neural networks or a specific variant of it called as LSTM. Now I'm not going to dive into the details of that. I have separately made a video on recurrent neural networks. You can check that over there. Just know that recurrent neural networks is a particular form of artificial neural networks which does well on sequence of data, right? And LSTM is a form of recurrent neural networks, which is one of the most widely used networks for the purpose of time series forecasting because it does really well when the sequence of the data is very important. That is what we're going to be using it. Let's just straight dive into the code and I'm going to explain everything as we move forward. The first thing is to import some important libraries like pandas, numpy and matplotlib.py plot. And the first thing we do is we read our data set, which is present in a CSV format and basically for monthly production of milk in from a particular factory. I'm going to give you this notebook as well as the data set in the description and you can just play around with this code. And basically I'm mentioning that the index column is a column called as a date. And when I write past dates equals to true, it makes sure that the pandas recognizes that there's a date in the time series and it does not treat it as a normal string. And I run this code, I specify that the index frequency is MS, which basically means that I'm dealing with monthly data. Normally it can automatically infer that as well, but I'm still just specifying it. So I print the first five rows using df.head and I can see this is how my data looks like. It is ranging from 1962 and it is monthly data about the production. The next thing, the first thing that we should do is plot the data set. And I'm mentioning the figure size as 12,6. And this is how my data looks like. All right. So right off the bat, I can view that there is some sort of uh, seasonality, a repeating pattern and a general trend that is increasing with time. Right. So to view in detail about the different components, like what is the exact seasonal nature? What is the trend like? We use something called as the stats model and we imp and we import a function called seasonal decompose, which is basically going to decompose different parts of the time series. So once you run this, you simply give it your data set and uh, I give it which column I want to perform the decomposition on. And when I simply write plot, it will show me various components of the graph, right? It will show this is how the observed pattern is. This is just the same uh, graph that we've seen above. This is just compressed on a smaller scale. Now, when you see trend over here, basically isolating the trend and removing the seasonal pattern. So you can see that there's a general increasing trend with time. And the seasonal part of the graph basically shows you just the seasonality by subtracting and removing the trend from the original graph. And we can see a clear seasonal pattern over here. And this is the residual part, right? This is basically whatever that cannot be explained by your trend or seasonal, basically the noise part of a data set. So this is the first analysis that we have done right now. Normally you should also check for stationarity. And if your data is not stationary, you should make it stationary first, but I'm not going to do that now because technically recurrent neural networks do not need stationary data. They can perform on non stationary data as well because recurrent neural networks can learn complex patterns in your data, right? Arima models that Sarima models that we've seen before are basic regression models. So recurrent neural networks can work on non-stationary data. However, if your model is not able to make good predictions, then converting your data into stationary can be a good option because that makes it easier for the model to learn the pattern. So I'm not going to do that now. You can check out my previous video on prediction with Arima model. There I have explained how to use the augmented Dickey filo test in order to determine whether it's stationary or not. But let's just skip that for now and see how our neural network model performs if we simply provided the data. So first thing I check, what is the length of the data set, right? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to split the data set into a training part and a testing part in my training section. I'm basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to use all the values except the last 12 months. I'm going to leave the last 12 months as the testing set. So basically I'm going to train the model and then use that to make a prediction on the last 12 months of the data set. So for that, I simply subtract 12 from 168 
which is basically 156 and the first 156 values I have reserved in train and the last 12 values, last 12 months data I'm keeping in the test set, right? Now what we're going to do is we're going to pre-process the data. This is a very important step for neural networks. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be using a min-max scalar to convert the data set into a scale of 0 to 1. Let me tell you why this is important. Let me just print the first five values and the last five values using the head and tail function. And here is how the data looks like, right? You can see there's a difference in the magnitude from the range of 500 to the range of 800, right? So we don't want the model to get confused because of different ranges of magnitude. So it's always a good step to convert the data into a scale of zero to one. So first we fit the scalar object that we have created on the training set which will basically be calculating the minimum value, maximum value, standard deviation and all. And we're going to be transforming both the training and testing part using the scalar object, using the transform function. So now if I simply print the first 10 values, I can see that these values will be in a range of zero to one. So now what we're going to be doing is we're going to be formatting the data exactly to give it to the neural network model. This is the only difficult part I would say if you're looking add a code like this for the first time, but let me break it down. So to give to the neural network model, what's going to happen is I'm going to give a sequence of data, right? Let's say I'm going to give it values of three months or 12 months, and that will be the input. Using that, it will give me a prediction for the next month. So to give you an example, let's look at this. Let's say you have an input in this format. I'm going to give it three values of sequence, right? I'm going to give it one, two, and three. This is the input. Using that, it should predict the next item in the sequence, which is four. Right. So if I want to give it 12 months as the input, so then since this supervised learning, I need to give the model the input and output beforehand. So I need to give it 12 months as the input and what would have been the next month's prediction. So I want to create batches like this to train our neural network model. Our job is very easy. We simply use something called as the time series generator. And for example, let me show you how it works. Let's say instead of batches of 12 at a time, let's say I'm only using three months three values at a time. So the number of inputs is going to be three. The number of features is one. Number of features would be more if you're using multiple time series to make a prediction, but that's not the case. And we simply call the time series generator. We give it the scale training input and we give it what is the number of inputs we want. To show you how the generator has converted the data, let me take the first value in the generator and, and extract the input and output X and Y from it. And let me just print it and show you how it looks like. So here is how it looks like, right? The first three values are taken as one batch. Using that, it has to predict the fourth value. And let's say I print, instead of zero, I print the first batch, right? Well, now what should happen is I have to take the next three values, which is 0 0.019, 0 0.209, and 0 0.245 to predict the fifth value in the time series. So, so when I print this, that is what happens. So that is how the generator is working. It's basically creating batches of three, three inputs and using that to make predict the next value. If I print the shape of this, this is how it looks like, right? Because at a time there's one row, there are three columns, and this fourth dimension is basically for the number of features, which is also one. So here I created batches of three at a time. If you want to take 12 months and predict the next value, then I'm gonna change the same code into n input is equal to one, right? And I simply run the code and the data has been generated. Now is the easier part. I simply call the model. I'm calling the sequential class, the dense and the LSTM class. And here is the part where I'm actually creating the model. When I write sequential, it basically makes sure that the layers are going to be added in a sequence one after the other. And I'm going to be adding an LSTM layer with the hundred neurons and the activation function as the ReLU activation function. And I've specified what is the input shape of our data. And here is a final output layer which is gonna make the final prediction. And I simply compile the model using the Adam optimizer and the mean square error as the loss function. You can print the model summary as well. This is how your model architecture looks like. We are almost done with the code. However, there's one more tricky concept of how to actually make predictions. So we'll get to that. And basically now I'm gonna fit the model. We simply have to call the generator which has the input and output for training the model. And I'm gonna run it over 50 epochs. So let's wait for this training to get completed. So once the model training is completed, I'm going to be plotting the loss per epoch, which the model stores after every epoch. And I'm going to simply plot it. You can see that the loss has been decreasing 
with every epoch and I could have stopped somewhere at 30 epoch as well because the loss did not decrease significantly after that. Now is the important part on how to make the predictions actually. So let me show you how we have to do this. Now what happens is I'm going to take 12 values at a time and use it to predict the next month value. So let's say I have 1, 2, 3 as the input. Using this, I'm going to predict the next value, which is going to be 4. Right? Now to make a prediction for the next value, I have to reformat the input. The input has to be changed to now 2, 3 and 4. Then I'm going to make a prediction that the next value in the sequence could be 5. Using this prediction, I have to append it onto the original input and I'll get the new sequence as 3, 4, 5. Right? And then I'll predict that the next value can be 6. So we have to make predictions on the tw last 12 values, get the next value, then create a new input to make a future prediction. So this is how that code looks like. This is the only complex part which you have to actually understand. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be taking the last 12 values, last 12 months values in my training set to make a prediction for the first value in the test set. All right. So before making prediction, I also have to reshape the data. Basically, I have to get it in a format, something like this. Right, one comma the number of uh, inputs and the number of features. Right, so that is what I'm reshaping it as because that is how the model has been trained on. So when I make a prediction, it will make a prediction for the first value in the testing set. So I can actually check the what the actual value was and see how close we were. So the original value was 0.67. The model has predicted 0.60, which is pretty close. So once that is done, now we are ready to make predictions on the testing set, and this is very easy to understand. You just have to look at this code a few more times. Just understand the concept. So we're creating an empty list of test predictions. We're going to take the last 12 values in the training set and we're going to be reshaping that, right? We're going to be calling it the current input or the current batch of 12 values. Now we iterate through the testing set and basically what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be using the last 12 values in order to make a prediction. All right. And I'm going to store it as the current prediction. And I append that prediction into this test predictions list. Now what I'm going to be doing is like in this case, we had one, two, three and four as the prediction. I have to reshape the input. I have to replace four into the original input. I'm going to be taking the current batch. And what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be appending to it current prediction. When I write one colon, it basically means I'm going to be dropping the first input, right? So it's taking the 12 values, making a next prediction. Using that prediction, it's getting a new input of 12 values and using that, it's again making a prediction, right? So that is how it works. Axis equal to one basically means it's going to be appending it along the column like we wanted. So that is done. Once you've done this, you can print the test predictions. And one problem is that you can see it's a range of zero to one. We have to transform it back into the original scale because the original testing values are in a scale of 800, 900. I'm going to take the scalar object and I'm performing the inverse transform on the test predictions and I'm appending this prediction into the original test set, right? So now we can simply call the plot function and you'll be able to see how the test values compare to the predictions. And in this graph, I can see that they are pretty similar, right? The model has done a pretty good job. If you want to put a number to how good the prediction is, you can simply calculate the root mean squared error using the functions from sklearn and the math library. And I'm basically giving it the input as the original testing values and the predictions, right? So the root mean squared error, as you can see, was around 24. If you use some other model, you can use this as a baseline to compare how good other models perform with respect to your recurrent neural network. So that was it with this video. If you did like this video, do like it and subscribe to this channel. I'm going to be making a lot more videos on similar topics like this and see you on the next video.